welcome to Ride Around the Murray. I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri elders and the Wiradjuri country on which the WAM Festival is based in Albury. I'm Jane Rawson and I'm coming to you from La Truida, Aboriginal land, which we call Tasmania. I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of the land, the Palawa people, who belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. Welcome to our viewers and listeners on YouTube and Facebook Live. Toward the end of the session, I'll be taking your questions submitted via your chat function. Today, I'm talking with Paddy Manning about his new book, Body Count. Paddy is contributing editor for The Monthly and author of four books, including Inside the Greens and Born to Rule, the unauthorized biography of Malcolm Turnbull. He's worked for the ABC, Crikey, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, the Australian Financial Review and The Australian. Hi, Paddy. Hi, Jane. How are you going? Yeah, really good. And I'd like to also acknowledge a, I'm on uh, Fidjigal country, uh, the Fidjigal clan from the Eora, Na Eora Nation, and uh, pay my respects as well to their elders, past and present, and acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded. So I'm up in Maroubra uh, in southern Sydney, and, uh, yeah, it's a cracking Sunday. Yeah, it's pretty nice here too. <laughs> what a country. Um, so, Paddy, in body count, you investigate Australian disasters and health crises where climate change has played a role, Black Saturday fires, Queensland floods, Melbourne's thunderstorm asthma outbreak and others, and you look at the deaths that they've caused. Out of all the projects that you could devote a few years of your life to, what was it that made you want to do this one? Well, thanks, Jane. Yeah, I think what, um, as a journalist, I've, you know, written about climate you know, on and off uh, in, with sort of different hats on for, you know, uh, almost 20 years. And and it seemed to me that when these disasters happen, uh, it's generally been sort of somehow seen as political or opportunistic to start talking about climate change. Uh, and the science that um, will attribute, you know, detect the climate fingerprint or attribute a particular extreme weather event to warming um, that science might take years to come to come in, and and so the conversation is actually never had. Uh, you never talk to the victims of these disasters about warming, and I thought that you know it was sensitive ground, but that it was important ground, and so I decided to have a crack at um, at at approaching people. You know, some of these event, events are very high profile, and we know who we know who died. Um, and I thought, well, I'll go and I'll go out to you know, their community, wherever it is, whether it's King Lake or Grantham or, um, you know, down in Tassie near Launceston, the little town of La Trobe there, Ooze, you know, and I'll, I'll go up to Townsville and I'll find the people who've lost loved ones and I'll ask them what they think about climate change and what contribution they thought climate change made to the event that, you know, cost them so dearly. That seems like it would be... Um quite a terrifying undertaking for me. I mean, when I write about climate change, I tend to, you know, sit behind my computer and do my research via the internet. Um, the idea of going out and talking to people who have lost loved ones due to climate change seems pretty terrifying. Was it was it hard for you to work yourself up to do this? Yep, uh, it <laughs> was. And because people, you know, I learned a lot in the process um, and uh, one of the things I learned is that the trauma never goes away, and that sounds very obvious, but it doesn't matter whether you're interviewing someone about a disaster that happened as in the Canberra bushfires in 2003 or a disaster like the Townsville floods that happened only you know a bit over a year ago uh, or the black summer we've just been through. Uh, the the trauma is, is still there, and, um, and so they are confronting conversations to have and I'm not a psychologist I'm not a counselor I'm not a, a I'm just a journalist and so I'm not kind of equipped in some ways to um, you know deal with uh, people's trauma I can all I can do is approach them and be honest about what I am doing what the project is and give them of course the opportunity to say no I don't want to be involved which yeah. you know some people did um, and then and then deal with them respectfully. So 
uh, it seemed to me very important that I made sure that they had a chance to review in draft what they had said and what I'd done with the interviews that they gave me and to make sure that they were happy with, you know, over a period of time, not a rush job, not a, tab, you know, sort of tabloid hit job or a sensational exercise, but to not beating it up or down, just tell it straight and the way they told it to me. And, uh, and it seemed, so I felt that that, what was encouraging was that people were happy to talk. They do have their own thoughts about, um, you know, climate change and, and what needs to happen and, and whether it played a role, you know, in the death of their loved ones. And I think those thoughts are important, you know. Um, I think that, you know, we can learn something about the risks that we're running uh, with climate change um, from the people that have lost the most to it, you know, the true stories of ordinary Australians. Even if, even if, just like any random, in some ways it's a random sample of people, they have a, a mix of opinions about climate change just like the rest of the country does. That was uh, yeah. so, yeah, it was confronting, but it was also kind of, it, I also found those people inspiring and their willingness to talk and think out aloud about it uh, quite inspiring and their yeah. honesty. Definitely, yeah. The, the people who I talked to when we were writing the handbook, for example, yeah, I talked to someone who had lost their house in the Canberra fires and he was just really keen to talk about it, to have a chance to talk about this experience because, like you said, it never goes away and it's not as though you asking the question is bringing up something they're not thinking about already. This is this is on people's minds. And, yeah, he told me, you know, that his wife is still reaching for saucepans that she lost, you know, 10 years ago. It just, it doesn't stop. Um, um, one of the things that I have heard often over the time I've been working in climate change is this idea that, oh, well, you know, it's hard to explain it to people as an abstract idea, but once people start feeling the effects themselves, they'll change, they'll want action, things will start happening. But a, a thing that I got from your conversations with people was that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, that when, when you spoke to people, how, how did, the, having lost someone to climate change, how did they feel about climate change and taking action on it? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it kind of, it was, it was interesting. So I think I did start with the idea uh, that the people who have lost, um, you know, family to, um, you know, some of these disasters um, would be strongly um, in favour of action, you know, um, so that a similar thing doesn't happen again or to anyone else. And and it's not that clear cut at all. Uh, and so, for example, you know, in the Canberra bushfires, um, I interviewed David Tenner, who lost his wife, Alison. Uh, you know, he was in Sydney. Um, stationed with the Air Force uh, on the day in January when those fires ripped through the suburb of Duffy and had no idea that, uh, that the fire had taken, you know, burnt their house to the ground and taken his wife's life. Uh, he found out on television that the fire, you know, by watching the television at his mate's place uh, up in Richmond in northwest Sydney where the Air Force base was, um, he found out that a fire had burnt his house, it burnt down his suburb and then drove down to Canberra uh, to find out and couldn't get his wife on the phone, obviously. It turns out, um, so Alison died in their home, uh, you know, and there were multiple failings by the ACT authorities and fire chiefs in terms of the way they responded to those fires, uh, which were then subject of a commission and subject of a class action, which David joined. You know, the immediate cause of Alison's death was a fire that um, was actually scientifically the first around the world in which there was this uh, phenomenon of a fire nado, a fire tornado um, whipped up in the, um, as three fires converged in on this plantation right next to the suburb of Duffy on the western edge of Canberra. And uh, so there was an unprecedented kind of fire intensity, there was uh, mismanagement of the fire. And then somewhere in there um, is the contribution that warming had made. And interestingly enough, in talking to David, 
uh, you know, he has his own views about climate change, like everyone has a view, but it's not, he, he says himself, I'm, I'm strictly a layman on this, uh, but uh, his view was that, you know, fires are increasingly caused by dry lightning. Dry lightning is happening more often. And what he said to me, and, it, you know, I had a number of conversations with David, and what he said to me on the first one was, if it can be shown that this fire was caused by dry lightning, um, then I guess I would say that Alison was a victim of a, of a climate, you know, climate change disaster. And, and so I interviewed scientists from as a, um, the Bushfires and Natural Hazards Research Centre down in Wollongong. And, and they told me that, the, that those fires were the first in which more than a million um, hectares were burned as a result purely of dry lightning and that those fires had, were extremely significant, from, you know, scientifically. And funnily enough, after I finished writing the book, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology's um, uh, chief, uh, one of the scientists um, who looks at climate there, uh, Carl Braganza, told the recent Bushfires Royal Commission that the Canberra fires in 2000, uh, uh, 2003 were the, that was the point where fires really started, fire behaviour really started to change. And so there's a lot of science sort of underpinning the, the fact that, you know, those fires were the first fatal um, bushfire uh you know, that you could confidently say was was linked to warming. And David came around to that idea himself in the process of talking to me for this book. And and he's not a climate activist by any stretch, and he's probably on the conservative side in terms of his politics. Uh, but he said he was ha happy in the end that the story was documented and, you know, for posterity, the story of his wife's death, and he said it, it has only been in the most, you know, in the last few years, in fact, since he's remarried, that he's been able to talk about it at all. So, you know, it does it does take time for people to realise, you know, that warming is making a contribution to these, um, to the severity or frequency of these disasters, and that and that it's and that it's having an impact on their on their own life, um, and. So I, I I hope that I hope that the book has has kind of not short circuited but just jo it joined the dots is the way I'm kind of talking about it joined the dots between the tragedies the science and 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 the solutions you know what what we need to do uh, to respond to these to, to to respond to the risks that we you know that we're facing. And yeah, I think reading those personal stories as well is a different way of talking about these issues. I mean, there's there's plenty of things you can read out there that are about the science or about what it's doing to ecosystems or about what it might do to us in future. But having those personal stories told by the people who've been affected by it, I think who are you know as as awful as it might be, it's hard for us sometimes to empathise with people in completely different cultures or different places to us. But seeing regular everyday Australians talk about how their lives have been affected, I think is, is really compelling. So yeah, it was a really, it's well, a really great read. <laughs> thank you. Well, I think yeah. the thing is that the climate debate has got lost in, you know, parts per million of CO2 and percent emissions reductions targets and impact on electricity bills and all these facts and figures. And I think that uh, we're missing the real impact of uh, that warming is having. And and we're missing the the big picture, and and that it and so it sounds like alarmist to say climate change is killing us, but it is the reality, and um, and it's not, you know, we talk about climate as though it's a problem for future generations and or a problem for you know it's an environmental issue, it's not. It's a it's it's a it's a grave danger to our health, and yeah. um, and. And I think, you know, I interview plenty of experts who, who believe that that is the kind of golden thread um, that you can get people uh, to think about climate differently uh, if, if we can focus on the threat that it poses to the health of them and their community and their loved ones. Yeah, for sure. And, and in the book, you quote a 2015 World Health Organization report that says climate change is going to lead to malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea and heat stress and 
will kill an additional 250,000 people around the world every year between 2030 and 2050. Um, I guess once upon a time, I would have thought even, you know, a year ago that an impending wave of deaths would make governments take action on something like this. But I guess as we've seen during this COVID pandemic, there are a few governments around the world who are fine with letting parts of their population die. Um, do you think as deaths from climate change increase, do you have any thoughts on how governments here and overseas might react to these deaths? Well, yeah, I do. And uh, I think that COVID has been very instructive. And so uh, one of the, you know, in a, in a kind of, I have a chapter called Hope at the End because I, I tried to, um, I thought it would simply be uh, too gloomy or grim if I only went through uh, and looked at, you know, fire, flood, disease, heat, uh, and gave no kind of sense of, um, of, of, what we might do, and so, um, what Australia is Australia is good at public health. Actually, we have a proud history of world-leading public health campaigns. So HIV/AIDS, you know, uh, we we went out early, hard with public awareness about safe sex, and that campaign was um, it, successful. We have got great gun laws as a result of the Port Arthur massacre. We have got, um, you know, we have led the world on plain packaging legislation to control tobacco. Um, and, you know, we have been responded very successfully to this pandemic, you know, focusing people on social distancing, you know, the lockdown, border closures. Uh, we, and, it, and in each case, you know, what you see is Australia has an educated population, you would expect, an educated population, we are wealthy, we have a um, strong public health system uh, and the community is able to um, act responsibly, uh, you know, collectively uh, to tackle a health issue when, when they understand it. And what's missing here in the climate debate is that kind of public awareness campaign that would, that would come from the government to the population to say, we are facing, you know, regardless of what happens, whether we stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, we are facing a world that's going to get, you know, 0.5 to 1 degrees hotter at least. And we already now understand very well the risks that we're running and we need to educate people. And so what was a glaring lesson for me out of this uh, exercise of talking to 15 or 16 different people who've kind of lost, lost family one way or another um, in, in, in a, that's linked to warming is that it's not climate change killing us, it's ignorance. Like if people understood the risks, they would act. But I think that there has been deliberately uh, a, a failure of governments to explain the risks. They don't want to know. And, I mean, we saw a story the other day about how much science uh, gets censored, self-censored or censored yeah. either by, you know, by government scientists. Um, uh, it just never makes it to the um, to the top, to the ministers who are generally responsible. I mean, that's just one example of how government is kind of willfully, um, willfully ignoring these risks. And uh, yeah, there's, and yet there's plenty to do. And your own handbook on how to live with climate change has got is full of okay, what. What do we need to do together? You know, we're not just bunnies in the headlights here um, facing this hotter world. There are a lot of things we can do to reduce risk, reduce fatalities, um, you know, look after each other. But you just need the government to raise the awareness in the first place. And they have Australia has been shown that we can do that, um, uh, but we have failed to do it on this issue. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've... I guess I've been I've been reading and writing about climate impacts for a while now, but um, reading your book, I realised I've been quite narcissistically focused on what was going to happen in urban and coastal Australia. Um, and I was genuinely shocked reading your book to read your coverage of what's going on in Indigenous communities in the centre and the north of Australia. And I wondered if you could just tell us a bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, like I didn't go to, I mean, I have been to Tennant and I've been to Alice and so forth, but uh, uh, but I didn't go for this book specifically 
to talk to uh, you know communities out in the you know um, center. Uh, but I did interview a few people, and I interviewed one of the people I interviewed was Simon Quilty, who's a um, emergency doctor up at uh, well, he was based at Catherine. I think he's now, he's since moved, but when I interviewed him, he was at Catherine, and he was saying to me in very clear terms that uh, you know there are parts of the territory that will sooner rather than later become uninhabitable uh, simply for humans because but it will get too hot. And, you know, Australia is, and this is why I thought the Australian experience of, you know, climate-related mortality is interesting even on a, you know, in a global sense because, because Australia is one of the rich countries most vulnerable to warming. We're already hot, uh, you know, and, and so the projected kind of temperature increases for places, for, including in the, you know, Northern Territory, uh, because we always talk about averages and we always talk about how, oh, maybe it'll get two degrees warmer. And I think a lot of people don't understand what mm. what risk that carries, uh, you know. But, of course, the average is kind of misleading in itself. And in some parts of the Territory, we're looking at seven degrees warmer. And and that will become impossible for human life. And, um, and when I spoke to... Um, I, I was struck by an appearance on Q and A actually of a guy called um, Bruce Shillingsworth, who's a um, he's a from Burrawarna, an Indigenous activist and educator and artist, and he got on uh, a water episode of Q and A and um, and just tore up the panel, saying, "Put the water back in the ri our river, you know, it's the Darling River, the Barker," and he he. Um, Okay, so he, he is campaigning, he, he is accusing, you know, big irrigators and, and corporations of water theft, uh, you know, and saying that First Nations right to water has been, you know, which is, a, which is globally recognised, has been, you know, infringed here. Uh, so he's not a climate activist, but he sees the connections. And when I interviewed him, he describes it as a second wave of genocide. You know, so when you've got um, the theft of water, uh, you've already taken the land, then you take the water. And then I think in some ways we're talking about then taking a livable climate. Um, it, it's, 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 it, is a, it is akin to genocide, uh, except, of course, there are also non-Indigenous communities in the Territory that are fearful and um, threatened by uh, exactly the same heating. And the Territory Government, I think, is... Uh, you know, there. I think the environment minister only recently said we've got to get, we've got to face up to the fact that you know this is a grave threat to the territory. Uh, but that's just an off the cuff comment. I mean, you need a response. You need a proper response. And Simon Quilty was saying to me, basically, that the territory health administrators, the government, was just not up to, uh, not not a, not able to confront it and not able to deal with it. Uh, you know, they, they're focused on a gas boom. They're focused on, you know, royalties from mining, uh, and and the the narrative of you know extreme heat striking the territory uh, just cuts across all of that. And uh, and yeah, I think it's actually one of those issues where you really do need the federal government to to step in. But of course, we know where the federal government is on on climate change, and and part of my thinking with this book was. Let's stop talking about the politics because we've been talking about it for 20 years. And, uh, and in the meantime, uh, we've got people, we've got Australians dying here. Let's look at them. Um, yeah, I, I, I felt that quite strongly. And knowing your background, I mean, you've, you've written a lot about Australian politics previously. Um, uh, you know the Greens in particular really well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, given that this is in so many ways a failing of government in Australia at, at a variety of levels, do you see any prospect of solving climate change in Australia via our democratic process? Um, and if you don't, what, what do you think is the best route for getting on top of this? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't go there in the book, but I do, um, you know, I do think that, uh, well, first of all, in some ways, the government, you know, shamefully is is just behind the community, behind the, you know, business, 
uh, behind, um, you know, where um, the population is, I think, on, on, on climate. And that actually, you know, Australians, whether it's record installation of, you know, rooftop solar uh, or, you know, I mean, it's difficult for Australia, obviously, because we're, you know, the world's biggest exporter of seaborne coal. You know, we're the world's biggest gas exporter. We have a highly fossil fuel dependent economy. Uh, you know, that's been recognised internationally as far back as the Kyoto Agreement when they allowed us to continue to increase our emissions. You know, uh, we are like Norway, uh, like Canada, a rich country that is heavily, heavily exposed to fossil fuels. So we have a difficult transition to make. But I think that Australia, you know, and so I think our debate is some, in some ways it's stuck behind the rest of the world. You know, in co other countries, other, you know, advanced economies are just going for it. Um, and so in Europe, you know, for example, um, even in England under a conservative uh, Tory government, uh, they have got, you know, uh, aggressive emissions reduction targets and, uh, and, and, uh, and are going for broke. Um, I think Australia, you know, Australia, all of Australia's states have got, um, have committed to net zero by 2050. Net zero by 2050 is very, is, is hard to do. It's only 30 years away. And, mm. uh, and th that target is a meaningful target. And if we can do that, um, the fact that the federal government, you know, is not helping, um, I think that position can't continue forever. Um, I can't, I can't see how the, where the circuit breaker comes. Um, uh, but I don't think that the, you know, the Morrison government now pursuing a gas-led recovery, they are not going to change their spots. Um, the Berejiklian government, you know, to look at another conservative government, is in the process of transitioning, I think, in their attitudes to renewable energy. And you've got an environment minister there, Matt Keane, who's, who is talking about renewable energy. I haven't actually yes. done much yet. Um, South Australia, you've got, you know, Tasmania, you've got um, conservative governments that are 100% on board with aggressive, you know, transition to renewables. So I think, I think, I don't think the federal kind of impasse can continue forever. I just don't know where the, where the break point comes. And, and maybe that's one thing we have learnt from this pandemic is, is states are, are getting mm, tougher at going, actually, no, we're doing it this way, even if they're theoretically the same alignment as the federal government they're they're feeling happier about going yeah we don't like your direction we're gonna we're gonna do our own thing um i'm absolutely i'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a few questions hmm, now let's start now why not um we have a question here from bronwyn chapman um she says people need to see the meaning to them every person needs to see the meaning to them and mass communication is only step one People can't let go of their current understanding unless they see how new information leads to a new life for them. What What do you think about this? Um, yeah, I think that people, I think that Australia, you know, just, I mean, I'm, I kind of, I preface it by saying I, I don't have the answers at all. Uh, you know, all I've, what I've done here is talk to a sample of Australians uh, who, you know, who have been through a traumatic experience and um, and I've asked them their views on global warming. And so, and so I, I can talk in detail about, uh, about what they told me. You know, I, I think, um, and, and maybe that's more interesting, you know, than, than my own personal views, you know, about you know, what I found when I spoke to these, and I decided that I would try and tell fewer stories better rather than telling hundreds of stories, you know, because there have been lots of deaths, particularly in something like heat. Uh, you know, there have been hundreds and hundreds of deaths or smoke in the recent Black Summer fires, you know, hundreds, uh, 400 plus uh, just in that one bushfire season alone. So uh, so what I, what I took from um, the willingness of these uh, people who've suffered so much to talk to me is that is that people are actually open to uh, and happy to have a conversation about global warming. It's just that so much of the political debate has has passed them by. Uh, they've they, they the people I spoke to have 
generally, not always, a lot. some of them were climate activists and very much aware of the uh, risks. Uh, some of them were, you know, government, um, a couple were government advisors, very much aware of global warming as an issue. But the people I spoke to by and large uh, were um, uh, up for the conversation that they, uh, up for a conversation that they hadn't, they just hadn't had. And, uh, and so what I took from that is people are willing to and able to engage with this topic if you talk to them about it. And uh, it doesn't take a hell of a lot. Uh, in talking to me, they're not talking to an expert. You know, I spoke to a lot of climate and health experts in this, you know, in researching this book to make sure that the case studies that I've used are actually valid and, and they do represent events and uh, or diseases that are, you know, likely to become worse under warming scenarios um, that we can expect. Uh, so, and that was the point. You know, I can never prove that uh, a particular death was caused by global warming, of course, uh, but I can I can draw connections and and talk about probabilities and talk about risks and uh, and and I've made sure that I've done that in a way that's rigorous. Uh, but yeah, I think um, people do do need to be educated and the rest will follow from there i mean maybe that's naive but uh, if people understood the risks better they would act they would act to protect themselves and to protect their loved ones and my book is full of stories of how people do care about each other they do care about their loved ones and it's and it was the most inspiring thing to me to know that i i think that when you know when the chips are down australians do look after each other and uh and they will you know, as, as, you know, we face one, you know, disaster after another, um, at some point uh, the penny will drop. And, uh, and yeah, so I don't think it's a very clear answer to the question. I'm sorry, but, um, but, but, yeah, I don't think the problem is with the people. I don't think the problem is with people. I think the problem is with government. Yeah, yeah, I think that, um, yeah, like you said, once people get a chance to talk about, their own ideas about this and to ask questions and to listen and um, have that kind of experience of talking about climate change within the frame of their own lives and their own experiences. Most people at some level or another are like, yeah, this this seems like a thing and something that we ought to be doing something about. Um, I guess, yeah, the problem is getting getting the chance to have those chats and those conversations and to, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there and, you know, um, but One I guess... of the people I interviewed was, um, was Rebecca Huntley, who has just written mm -hmm. a book, How to Talk About Climate Change Effectively. And interestingly enough, there's a little bit of research which shows that the people who are most exposed uh, to climate change are the ones most likely to be in denial about it. Uh, and... So you might think about that in terms of the territory or in terms of, you know, Queensland uh, and how uh, actually they are Queensland. Like so there's plenty of studies that show that uh, Brisbane, for example, um, you know, is, is very vulnerable to heat. And, uh, and it's sort of intuitively obvious. But, uh, but, of course, we've got a government, you know, that uh, the politics in, of climate change in Queensland are very, are very fraught because it's such a big export earner is, um, is coal out of Queensland. So... You know, um, I, I I hope that uh, yeah, I just hope that it, it this this book sparks a kind of conversation that hasn't been had before. Yeah, I think um, it does. It, it's a it's a different way of looking at it, and I think that's really important. Different people come to this discussion from different directions and need different information or want to talk about it in different ways. So the more different ways there are of discussing it, the better. And I think this is a really important addition to the literature on this. Um, Thank you. We, we've got another question in. Uh, it says, the, the Canberra fire happened in 2003. Did you draw from anyone's experiences earlier than that or is that the earliest climate event that you talk about in your book? That's the earliest one and it's an intriguing thing as to, well, when did this body count start? And, you know, I say in the introduction, well, it's probably a heat death. It's probably a statistical death, you know. Uh, the way um, epidemiologists, which, you know, the way they talk about, um, you know, mortality from heat uh, is in terms of excess deaths, uh, which is deaths that have happened sooner than would otherwise have occurred. And so heat waves, um, heat, heat is the biggest killer uh, of, you know, Australians by far of any natural hazard, more than the rest put together, whether it's, you know, fire, 
uh, flood, uh, cyclone, tsunami, earthquake, uh, you know, they're all outranked by heat. And, um, and it's pro- but the problem with heat deaths is that they're generally recorded as something else. They're generally recorded as a heart attack or a stroke. And, um, and so some of the scientists that I interviewed say have, have made a point recently of arguing that perhaps we should include some of this environmental data in our death certification process so that we um, maybe should be writing climate change on death certificates, you know. Uh, and, uh, and that was a point that was, you know, caused a sort of little tabloid kind of um, uh, sensation earlier this year when it was made in a, in a little Brit- British medical journal by some Australian scientists. Uh, but, you know, they accused them of politicising death certificates. But, um, but, yeah, I think that... Um, Oh, sorry, I've confused myself now. I've got. <laughs> so yeah, I've forgotten what the question was. I've gone and uh, talked in a circle. The earliest thing that you could come. Yeah, across when did it start? It's as fires, but yeah. Well, it is. There was a change, you know, and you won't get any scientists on the record saying when it started uh, at all. Uh, but they did say it. You know, if you look back at the list of um, extreme weather, like. Cyclone Tracy, no, it's yeah. that's too early. Um, you know the Black Saturday. Um, I mean, sorry, um, Ash Wednesday, too early. There's no, there's no climate fingerprint there. Um, but there is um, from uh, from 2003 in fire. Um, the link between climate warming and cyclones is kind of complex. The, the scientists are still researching because all of this, you know, the science is developing, of course. It's not like uh, the science is just there and it's done and it's finished and all we have to do is read it. Um, it's like the science is still evolving. And, uh, and yeah, there's um, w- what it looks like is that we might be facing uh, decreasing rainfall but more intense rainfall, so shorter, shorter interval, uh, intense rainfall. And... Uh, and that's what I found in this book is that, you know, flash flooding in Dungog or flash flooding in Ooze or La Trobe um, or, or as we saw in um, Toowoomba and Gran- um, Grantham in 2011. Uh, so that those kind of events have been happening sort of more often and taking lives more often. Now, there's plenty of things you can do. You know, if you look at, um, if you look at mortality over a century, Mortality from floods and from heat on a per capita basis or from bushfire has been going down because we've, we've got richer, we've got air conditioning, we've got, we're, you know, we're better, more aware, we've got better alerts of, about weather and disasters. And, uh, and so, but, but according to the science, you know, that, that could easily uh, start to trend, they could easily start to trend back up again, those per capita death rates. So it's a very fraught thing to try and pick a starting point, and nobody else has tried to pick a starting point that I'm aware of. But on a rule of, you know, just back of the envelope kind of estimate, it's somewhere about the turn of the century that we really are seeing climate starting to kill people. And it stands to reason if the World Health Organization is saying that from 2030, which is only 10 years away, we're going to be seeing 250,000 excess deaths globally every year from warming. Um, some of those are going to be in Australia for sure. And, and it won't happen in 2030 out of the blue. It's already started. Yeah. And I guess there are the things that are harder to link as well. For example, you know, the, the other day, obviously Melbourne is going through this terrible lockdown that I mean, not terrible. Yeah. Anyway, it's very difficult for them. They're having this lockdown. Yeah. And then recently they had a major storm event and for 24 hours, people had to boil their water in a lot of suburbs because yeah. this intense storm event had affected water supplies. And, you know, if someone had drunk the water and got E. coli from it and got sick and died a couple of weeks later, would you call that a climate change death? Who knows? It's very hard to draw some of these connections. And uh, we do have a question in um, asking if you found any evidence about suicides due to climate-related anxiety or depression. Well, I tried. And um, and it was the most um, sensitive uh, kind of terrain of all. And... I did interview a couple of people who, because I went 
you know, I just thought in a very, um, you know, sort of journalistic way, boiling it all down, I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of research about the mental health impacts of drought, uh, that, that farmers are the most heavily impacted. It goes back to a point you were making earlier, Jane, about how, you know, a lot, a lot of these um, risks are particularly, um, you know, uh, they are elevated in, in regional areas, uh, which makes it, you know, even more frustrating that, you know, conservative, you know, country party um, kind of politicians refuse to acknowledge climate change. But, but um, yeah, I, I um, um, did talk to a farmer called Charlie Prell, who uh, is himself, he's in New South Wales, um, southern uh, Tablelands, I think it is, uh, down near um, Crookwell. And he um, was one of the, his, he was a generational farmer. His, his family has a century of um, sheep farming and his great-grandfather, I think, was a pioneer uh, of sheep farming in Australia. Um, but he, in the millennium drought, um, felt like a failure and went through an episode of depression um, that, you know, he talks in my book about contemplating suicide uh, and ended up on antidepressants and then went public uh, about it as a farmer suffering himself from, you know, the mental health impacts of this drought, you know, because he had to sell off part of his farm. He felt like a failure that he'd let down his family's uh, legacy. Uh, he also, in that process, decided that he would start to act on climate change and he he allowed, he did a deal with one of the early wind farms uh, in New South Wales and that became a contentious issue in his community. Uh, and, you know, because there, there are people, one of his near neighbours is Morris Newman, uh, the former ABC chair and stock market, stock exchange chair, merchant banker who lives near Crookwell and who is a fierce uh, climate sceptic and opponent of wind farms. So he ends up, and, and very close to the energy minister, Angus Taylor, who's in the same area. Um, and, yeah, he, he ends up as a climate activist. He's part of a group called Farmers for Climate Action. But what I, and he is a, an inspiring, his story is inspiring and it's told in the book. What I didn't have was the story of a farmer who did, you know, commit suicide um, and get to talk to one of their their relatives about it. Uh, and I did try uh, because, you know, but it's just so sensitive. You know, people do talk about suicides in rural communities, but they, um, yeah, I didn't get, I didn't get an actual case study that would, you know, um, uh, of a death. So sorry, that's a long answer to the question, but it was a, in, interesting to me that that was the one area where I did I wasn't able to get an exact example. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we're almost out of time, but I wondered if I'm sorry. As, as, if that's okay. As, as you finish the book and it's out there in the world, um, what are you what are you working on now, other than talking about this topic? Uh, have you started a new project or? Uh, yeah, my next book is about a biography of Lachlan Murdoch, uh, actually. <laughs> so um, there's been umpteen books about Rupert, uh, but, yeah, no actual study of, uh, well, not a study, it's a, you know, it's an unauthorised biography, but, I've, you know, it'll be warts and all biography of um, Lachlan Murdoch, for obviously growing up as, you know, to um, the position as a Murdoch, you know, as part of this empire, but now the clear successor. And uh, and through all of the, you know, chapters of his life, whether from Super League to One Tell to you know, um, falling out, falling out with Roger Ailes, um, which yeah. people might recognise um, from the loudest voice. So yeah, it's a it's an interesting story in its own right, and I think um, yeah, I'm looking forward to to doing a good job of that. He'll he'll be running the country soon, so I suppose we might as well get out in front of it, find out a little more right about the world. it. Yep, that's right. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you want to get a copy of Body Count, uh, you can place an order with Dimmick's Albury, and if you're in Albury, they'll deliver that to you for free um, or for a discounted fee to other areas. And don't forget to hang around for the rest of the afternoon and watch what's left. I will be talking to people about animal magnetism at 1.30 if you'd like to drop in. 
And otherwise, go to rightaroundthemurray.org.au if you'd like to find out details of anything else that's coming up and go in the online survey. You could win cool stuff. Thank you very much, Patty Manning. It was really great to talk to you. I highly recommend reading the book. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you.